you boys knew what's about to happen to you, you'd leave now. Jack Reacher versus a gang of prison inmates. One versus five. The odds are definitely in Jack Reacher's favor. Reacher is an intimidating presence. In the novels, he stands about six foot five and weighs 250 pounds. He's a retired military police officer with years of real world experience and training under his belt. And in the new Amazon adaptation, Alan Richson is well suited and sized for the role. If it were anyone else facing down five angry inmates, some of them armed, I might be worried for them. But Reacher is anything but average, and these guys are in for a rude awakening. The leader of the gang motions for all of the men in the bathroom to leave. Cocky move. He seems very sure of himself, but when Jack Reacher starts counting, his opponents start dropping like flies. So I'll give you to the count of three. One. Whether it be a headbutt, a jab, a backhand, a forehand, a kick, or an industrial steel prison bathroom sink, a blow to the bridge of the nose is problematic for many reasons. Okay, Jack, pause right there. Thank you so much for giving me so many opportunities to talk about blunt force facial trauma. You are a friend of medical educators everywhere. Thanks, Doc, that really means a lot. A blow to the bridge of the nose can cause significant facial trauma whose extent depends on the amount of force used in the blow and the type of object used to strike with. In this case, Reacher strikes two different inmates in the same area, one with his forehead and the other with his fist. In the case of the headbutt, the forehead is a broad surface that is quite hard. So the force of impact is spread over a larger area. The impact would involve the bridge of the nose, but would also involve the cheeks or the maxillae, the nose itself, and possibly the orbitals bilaterally. In the case of the right cross, the fist presents a much smaller striking surface, so the impact would be more concentrated. Consequently, I would anticipate the zone of injury to be smaller correlating with the smaller striking surface, although the constellation of injuries associated with the punch would be similar to that seen with the headbutt. A study has shown that the average impact velocity for a headbutt, 4.7 meters per second, is considerably less than that of a punch, 12 meters per second. So, a typical headbutt is not likely to lead to life-threatening injuries, but bony injuries of the face, such as those described, can easily occur. Under certain circumstances, potentially lethal injuries could occur, but as I said, this is much less likely. However, the lethality of a given strike ultimately depends on what was used to strike the head, how hard the strike was delivered, and where the strike landed. Facial fractures, if present, would be stabilized with open reduction and internal fixation using contoured stabilization plates inserted through incisions whose location would be determined by the particular fracture pattern observed. So definitely, these henchmen are taking the shortcut to the infirmary. An uppercut is also troublesome, though the resultant injuries differ slightly. In this case, with the blow angled upward rather than directly to the face, the jaw or the mandible is the primary point of impact. If delivered with enough force, the mandible would be fractured. However, a dislocation of the jaw or mandible, of which there are four types, might also occur. The types of dislocation that could be associated with a powerful uppercut include posterior, superior, and lateral dislocations, with the names describing the respective directions in which the jaw could travel after being struck. Although these dislocations are potentially rare, the superior dislocation in particular is significant for its potential for injury to the facial and vestibulococular nerves and the temporal lobe as a result of the superior migration of the condyle of the jaw into the middle cranial fossa. Ouch! Sounds painful, and that's a freaking mouthful. Now, Jack, if you don't mind continuing the demonstration, can you show us what happens to people who approach you wielding a weapon? Sure, this guy came at me with a knife, eyes on the red arrow. So I gouged his eye out. 
Thank you, Jack. An excellent demonstration of the relative softness of the eyeball compared to the bones of the face. It looks like your thumb has entered that man's eye socket up to the level of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. You've got fairly large hands, so I think it is safe to assume at least a couple of inches of penetration. Now, just as I explained in my last video, explaining the shot glass attack in the equalizer, This henchman is probably going to lose an eye. No doubt about it. What? Did we just become best friends? Yup! Here, Reacher's thumb causes a blunt force injury to the globe. This is very likely to cause a rupture of the globe, since it is really difficult for the henchman's eyeball and Reacher's thumb to occupy the space available in the orbit at the same time otherwise. A rupture of the globe can be caused by a laceration of the globe or by blunt force, such as with Reacher's thumb. Patients presenting with a ruptured globe typically have decreased vision, which is not really good for remaining fight worthy. The eyeball itself is often visibly distorted and the pupil may be shaped like a teardrop. Occasionally, fluid will leak from the eye, which I am pretty much guaranteeing here. Excessive bleeding under the conjunctiva, the thin mucous membrane that covers the cornea, can also be a symptom of a ruptured globe, but I'm thinking that's not really required for diagnosis here. Laceration to the globe requires immediate evaluation by an ophthalmologist. CT is typically performed to confirm the diagnosis and to rule out the presence of any foreign material inside of the eye or the presence of any further damage around the eye. However, even after all possible medical and surgical treatment has been performed, serious eyeball lacerations or globe ruptures may still result in partial or total loss of vision. Yeah, I'm banking on that here. Great. but. What if that wasn't enough to incapacitate your attacker? Jack, would you mind demonstrating some other techniques one might apply to more robust opponents? Impacts like this to the spine and the back of the neck would be sufficient to cause significant injuries to the back and to the head. Blunt force trauma to the back is a fantastic way to break ribs, fracture the scapula on the back of the chest wall, and injure intrathoracic organs such as the lungs pneumothorax, hemothorax, or pneumohemothorax. It is also possible to fracture a vertebral spine or the posterior aspect of the skull when being thrown against a concrete wall. With an impact that is caused by a whipping motion, there is the real possibility of a skull fracture at the back of the skull or the occiput. This could be an isolated injury, but more than likely would be associated with a closed head injury as well. This could be simply a concussion that would be caused by the impact of the brain on the back of the skull, or if more serious, would be a brain contusion. If the damage is more severe, it might occur with bleeding inside or around the outside of the brain. These different kinds of bleeds could cause increased pressure within the skull and consequent compression of the brain. With enough pressure on the brain over a long enough period, permanent brain damage or even death could occur. But the leader of the gang is tenacious and follows up with a couple of blows of his own. <clears throat> Yeah, and I really didn't like that. So I kicked him in the nuts. And I broke his arm. In a prison fight, anything goes. And this swift kick to the family jewels stunned our gang leader long enough for Jack to work some magic on his arm. With this injury, Reacher bends the head henchman's arm over his knee at the elbow. Not really a problem, you say. Except that it is not designed to bend sideways at the elbow. The elbow is a hinge joint whose primary plane of motion is the sagittal plane. It has robust ligaments, the collateral ligaments, that prevent sideways opening either medially or laterally. However, even these collateral ligaments can be overcome by the might of a six foot five angry ex-marine warrant officer. This injury mechanism would cause a complete or near complete circular disruption of capsuloligamentous stabilizers, starting with the lateral collateral ligament or LCL first and working around the capsule to the medial collateral or MCL ligament. This would result in gross instability of the elbow, which would make it difficult for said henchman to use his shank holding arm. And with Jack Reacher, that's a problem that you don't want to have. Now, remember what I said about back injuries? To my eyes, these two impacts are a little more intense than the previous one. A 300 style front kick 
and then across the room back into the wall slam. Uh, Leonidas kick to the chest can easily result in an injury to the sternum or the breastbone. The sternum is a structure that connects the anterior ribs to one another in a semi-rigid manner to create a flexible cage in which the heart, lungs, and major vessels are contained. The ribs are connected to the sternum by cartilage articulations at sternocostal joints, and the sternum is stabilized between the ribs by its attachment to the two clavicles at the two sternoclavicular joints above. Dislocation of the sternum would require failure of several of the articulations, either at the sternocostal joints, the sternoclavicular joints, or both. With an impact from the front, we would anticipate the sternum would be fractured or dislocated posteriorly, or in other words, pushed back into the chest. The mediastinum is the space that is located in the middle of the chest behind the sternum. The mediastinum contains the heart, aorta, esophagus, thymus, trachea, lymph nodes, and some nerves. Dislocation of the sternum is generally not desirable, and if severe, can cause injury to any one of the structures located behind it. This would be bad, so generally I advise people not to get kicked. Correction, heel stomp in the chest. Combine this with the blunt force trauma caused by being punted into the wall, and I suspect that this henchman will have serious trouble breathing for an extended period of time. And in case you didn't get enough of the back smash from earlier in the scene, Reacher demonstrates it again with another henchman. Repetition for memory's sake. More blunt force facial trauma. Obviously effective approach, Jack, but perhaps for the sake of medical education, you could give us something different. You're kind of pissing me off, Doc. I'll see what I can do, but I don't like when people boss me around. How's that? Excellent. That's the kind of stuff we need. Here, Reacher stomps on a henchman's lower leg just above the level of the ankle. Of course, since the knee and the ankle are hinge joints, they can't really accommodate sideways bending. In the middle of the tibial shaft. This leaves the tibial shaft alone to resist the bending force applied to it. Now, if you've watched this channel long enough, you will know that bones are great in compression, but that they suck in rotation and that they don't fare too well in bending either. This injury mechanism would result in a fracture of the tibia at the junction of the middle and distal thirds. This would be expected to be a transverse fracture of the tibial shaft with an associated fracture of the distal fibula. If there were any element of rotation involved, then the fracture might have an oblique component. If the body were fortunate, this would be a closed injury. But if his luck were otherwise engaged, which, if you are fighting Jack Reacher, likely it is, it would be an open fracture where the bone fragments have perforated the soft tissue envelope and become exposed to the external environment outside. Open fractures would carry an added risk of infection and would be more likely to be delayed in healing. But whether open or closed, this fracture would require operative stabilization in a surgical setting. Generally, there are three ways to fix a lower extremity fracture surgically. An external fixator, plate fixation, or an intramedullary nail. An external fixator is a frame that is placed outside the leg and is attached to the leg with pins to stabilize the fracture externally. It is typically only used for temporary fixation and is usually replaced by internal fixation when the leg is more amenable to repair. Plate fixation is a form of internal fixation that may be used for definitive or permanent fixation. It is applied at the fracture site directly through a formal incision and spans the fracture site on the surface of the bone. It is secured with a number of screws both above and below the level of the fracture. Intramedullary nail fixation is another type of internal fixation that may be selected for definitive fixation. It is inserted away from the fracture site through the knee, but spans the fracture site within the bone. It is secured with a number of screws both above and below the level of the fracture. Here, if the fracture is very close to the level of the ankle, a plate will be used. However, if the fracture is sufficiently proximal to the ankle joint, an intramedullary nail will be used for fixation. I suppose that that is one way to get a break from day-to-day -day prison life. So that about wraps up today's class. Thanks again for our guest educator, Jack Reacher. Let me know in the comments what you'd like me to rack to next. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. And me, Jack Reacher, not your everyday medical educator. Let's go get some tacos, Chris.